going live. Hey everybody, it is Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network uh, from what is now Network HQ, my home in beautiful Tacoma Park, Maryland, just on the border of Silver Spring, uh, just outside of Washington, DC. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, folks are just beginning to stream in, so I'm gonna yak for a minute to try to get as many of you into the room as possible. Uh, if you've been with the Communications Network before for one of these, thank you so much, welcome back, glad to see you. Uh, we have a guest returning uh, with us today, Dr. Richard Wenzo, is one of the leads, uh, Leads. One of the world's leading epidemiologists and infectious disease doctors. We're grateful to have a little bit of his time today to talk to all of you about what we're learning about this novel coronavirus. The world just didn't see this thing five months ago, so we're learning new things every single day. And so he's going to share a little bit more about what he's learned just in the last couple of weeks. And we've already asked him he's going to come back in another couple of weeks' time to keep us informed and updated. Uh, before we get underway there though, let's just do a couple things that are our practice, sort of part of our community. If you would, go ahead and uh, take your finger, go down to the bottom there and hover for a quick second. You should see a couple of buttons pop up. One of them says chat, another one says Q&A. Uh, probably self-evident what those things could be. So go ahead and put your name, hey Dale, go ahead and put your name into the chat box if you would. I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Let's see if I can type and talk to y'all at the same time and just say, hi everyone. Uh, add your name, where you're from, and your here. Uh, I should also tell you our colleague, Carrie Klein, as she always does. Hey, Katie. Hey, everybody. Coming in from Denver. Jenny, Betsy. Okay, these guys, y'all are, are flying through here now. I can't even keep up. Erica, Trishna, Susan, Sherry, Jamie, Jody, Amy, Jessica. Okay, lots of folks. Go ahead and keep throwing your names in there. You can chit chat with one another while we're chatting over the course of this next hour. Our colleague, Carrie Klein, is taking really excellent notes. She will be throwing links into this chat box. So if we make mention of something that you need to know about, we will toss the link in here so you can avail yourselves of that. Our colleague, Gab Sarah Ferris, who's operating from her apartment down in Washington, DC, is following all of this on Twitter the way we always do. If you wanna follow along, one of those people who can manage two screens at the same time, God bless you. Uh, go ahead and uh, check it out on the hashtag comnetlive, C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. And you can see Yabby's notes, you can add your own talk to one another there uh, and then finally if you're looking for one another on social over the next couple of days we're using the hashtag comms for good that's c-o-m-m-s the number four g-o-o-d uh, so with that why don't we start to get underway uh, Tristan my colleague Tristan Mahabir is running the slides for us so Tristan if you'll advance to the next one first thing I want to just flag for you all we published an op-ed in the Chronicle of Philanthropy uh, just yesterday afternoon. Great thanks to Stacey Palmer and the team there. Uh, the piece is pretty simple. It's a message that y'all probably been hearing us say for the last couple of days. Tristan, if you'll advance to the next slide. Uh, these are some of the things that we think we should all be doing right now. These are kind of the key messages. You can skip reading the op-ed, although I'm sure Stacy would love to click. Uh, we should all, if you're working in a foundation or nonprofit, be spending a lot of our time. If you're doing communications for good, this is the good you can be doing. Let's all try to be amplifying the messages coming out from your local government, the CDC and the NIH. You can be doing that through your social channels or on your website. Uh, some examples, if you want to see what that looks like in practice, the California Healthcare Foundation has been a tremendous model. You go on their website right now, you will see a link to CDC and get the latest information there. If you can do that on your own website, whether you're a World Wildlife Fund or the Rockefeller Foundation, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You just never know in this crowded information space where people are going to go to get the information that must, might just uh, save their life or save the life of one of their neighbors or folks within their orbit. Uh, Tristan, if you'll go ahead to the next slide. Uh, if you can also do this, this is another way to be helpful, is send a message out to your grantees, to your clients, your supporters, and others to help them find resources. Not what you're doing, but help them find the stuff that they need. Again, this is a novel coronavirus. What we knew last week is different than what we know today. We're continuing to learn. The whole world is. So anything you can do to point people to the latest, best information is incredibly helpful and useful. So please, if you can, please try to use your channels to do that. Tristan, if you'll go ahead to the next one. This is the other thing that's probably worth y'all hearing. You've heard me maybe say this in a past webinar if you were with us. We are in an emergency right now and it is asymmetrical. So if you're in New York City, you probably have a different feeling about what you're sitting with at this moment, what we're all facing than maybe if you're in Taos, New Mexico. And so I think one thing that we could all do is because it's such a crowded information space, especially on social media where everybody has a microphone, slow down. Just like an ambulance coming up from behind you, just pull over a little bit. If it's not an essential message, if you're not using sort of the decision tree of, is this useful? Is this helpful? Will it help save a life? Will it 
stop another message that's vital from getting through. Maybe just pull those messages to the side for just now, if you don't mind too terribly. Unfortunately, I think Dr. Wenzel is going to tell us this. We're probably in this present situation for the next little while. As you might know, what it looks like in my home state of Maryland, we're on lockdown. Uh, but in Tristan's home state of Florida, they're not. So it's quite true that where you may be may feel a little bit different than where others may be. So getting these messages out, particularly from both those of us working in the social sector, uh, it's, there's a ton of evidence out there right now saying that foundations and nonprofits continue to be the most trusted sources of information, or among the most trusted sources of information, but certainly considered one of the most constructive forces for good in our society. So if you can leverage your reputational capital or what our colleagues uh, Neil Coleman and Judith Roden used to call the influence endowment, you can do a lot of good just by helping to get the word out. And again, Tristan, if you would go ahead, here's one way you can do that. Our friends at the amazing global design for an IDEO, you may be familiar with them, they're out in the Bay Area, just a tremendous group of folks. They want to help. So they got in touch with us the other day. You can find a link also in that Chronicle piece or in the chat, probably. Carrie will put it there in a moment. But the folk, good folks at IDEO have offered, if you are a nonprofit, so I'm sorry, friends at Gates and Ford, this isn't for you. But, but if you're a nonprofit or maybe a community foundation with limited means, and if you click on that link right there that Carrie just put in the chat, if you click on that, IDEO has offered to hook you up with a designer who will help you get the word out about COVID-19. So not your fundraising efforts, but if you want to help spread the word about how to put people in touch with information that might just save a life, the folks at IDEO want to help you. So if you go ahead and click in there, they'd be happy to put you in touch and, uh, and do something really quickly. A lot of us know how important design and information design is to getting the word out to people. They have a particular skill here. So grateful to them for taking the step and reaching out to us. All right, so with that in mind, I think it is now my time to, to wrap it up and hand it off to Dr. Wenzel. Sir, thank you again for being with us. We're grateful to see that you are in good health. Hoping everybody in your family, you know, the folks down in that Richmond region are starting to see some effects here. Uh, but if you would, sir, why don't you go ahead and take it away? We'll come back for Q&A, which can go down in that Q&A box. Again, if you hover, Q&A box is where we're gonna take questions over the course of uh, our time together. So thanks very much, Dr. Wenzel. Well, thank you, Sean. And for everyone who's uh, joined the webinar, thank you for joining. Uh, in this uh, slide, I also have my email address in case somebody has a burning issue or comment that they uh, haven't had answered. And I will mention uh, the names of a few drugs, but I want to point out that I have uh, no financial interest in uh, any uh, part of pharma, and I'm not on the board of any uh, part of pharma, so I have no financial conflict. Can I go to the next slide? So on this slide, you see uh, the iconic painting called The Screen, uh, and this is a painting by the Norwegian expressionist Edvard Munch from 1893. And as you look at this uh, figure here, yeah, I think you feel the desperation, the fear, and maybe the loneliness, and those of you, uh, who have been through the anxieties related to uh, COVID probably may uh, appreciate what the painter said when he was asked, how did you come to draw something like this? And his quote was, while walking at sunset on a path, suddenly the sky turned blood red. I stood trembling with anxiety and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. And I think particularly for first responders and others, uh, who have both physical and emotional exhaustion these days. I'm sure you sense an infinite scream passing through nature that we call COVID-19. Next slide. So this is a busy slide with a lot of information on international trend lines. And if you know that, first of all, each of the countries is listed here, and the total number of deaths that they have over time and to equalize whatever timing, uh, what the authors at uh, Hopkins did is they start to graph only after 10 deaths in each country. So it makes the starting time the same everywhere. So in the Y axis, the vertical axis, you see total number of deaths going from 10 to 10,000. And then on the X or horizontal axis, the number of days since the 10th death. So if you look, what we want to see here is the curve, since they're cumulative, the curves begin to bend to the right and then flatten out. That means there have been no incremental cumulative number of deaths 
and you've controlled the uh, the pandemic. So in yellow, way up that sees China up in the right hand side, uh, you see that has flattened off now and it continues. So that this is a couple of days old, and they really have a pretty good handle on controlling this, and we hope that they'll be able to continue that. Similarly, just if you go a little bit south to South Korea in the uh, blue, a little bit to the right. Again, bending the curve. And both of those countries started very early, aggressive social distancing, and particularly South Korea with case finding, finding all the contacts of every case, testing them, isolating them. And you can see even Japan a little bit lower towards the number 15. In contrast, if you see what's happening with some of the uh, curves that look at Spain and France and Italy, and even the United States right in the middle in the reddish color, we're fairly linear all the way. There looks like some hope in Italy at the top in the black bending over, and we hope that this continues. But if you look at the left, uh, and you can see going up the uh, horizontal, the vertical axis, China began its lockdown after 30 deaths. Very aggressive lockdown. Uh, Spain didn't start a lockdown until after 200. France after 175. In Italy, it was 800 deaths before they began their nationwide uh, lockdown. So the point of this slide is early and aggressive social distancing work along in concert in some of the countries with very aggressive case finding and identifying the contacts, isolating those who needed it. Next slide. So I'll show you three slides in a row that look at where the outbreak could spread if we do no control measures in the United States, if we did some modest control measures, and then if we became very extreme. And the code is up on the left, and it's a log code for the total number of new infections per day. And if it's pale, we're doing pretty well. If you start to get amber and then uh, orange, you actually go in this log scale from 100 to 1,000 new cases per day. So if you look at April and then May, we begin to see many areas looking orange and amber. And by June, the country looks like it's in bad shape, again, with hundreds and thousands of cases a day. Now, if the next slide shows where if we introduce some modest measures, some control measures. And again, uh, it looks like California, Florida, Northeast would face severe outbreaks that peak in the summer. So you could say, well, April, May looks pretty good. By the time we get to June, you begin to see, particularly in California and the Northeast. If you go to the next slide, what if we really have severe control measures? And as you know, the country is now going into almost a national lockdown. You can see the pale areas uh, in May and also in June. And I think that's important just image to have that we really need to do is whatever we can, particularly in social distancing and case finding. Now, the next slide, what I've done is uh, sort of propose a new, may, a new way for you to follow the arc of this pandemic. And that is to use the number of days, if you will, to double the cases. So currently at the top, you see approaching 200,000 reported cases. Now, many people think that the real number is gonna be five to 10 times that. But for this presentation, I wanted to be very conservative and said, Reality may be only 3.75 times the reported number, which says right now across the country, we could easily be having 750,000 cases. Then look, if doubling the number of cases occurs every three days, every five days, or every seven days, left to right. So if we have 750,000 now, we expect them 1.5 million double. If you're on the every three-day cycle for doubling by April 4th, or April 6th, the five-day cycling, or April 8th, seven-day cycling. Now, in a month with 30 days, with three-day cycling, there are 10 generations of doubling, six if you go every five days for doubling, and four for every seven days. 
So now it's important to look at the cases by May 1st. If we had on average, every three day doubling throughout the month of April, the entire country will be affected. And with 300 plus million people, we'd have a 1% mortality, which is fairly conservative. We have about 3 million deaths. We're not gonna do that. We already started uh, doing things two, three weeks ago. Now look at number uh, in the middle, if we can control things, so that we see doubling instead of every three, every five days, by May 1st, we'll still see 48 million people infected. That's 15% of our citizens. And in fact, still pretty tragic, 480,000 deaths. I think we can do scenario three. Every seven days, control the doubling every seven days with four cycles by May 1st, that's still 12 million people infected, 4% of citizens only. And it shows you a mortality of 120,000. This is pretty close to what Tony Fauci was suggesting uh, last night uh, with some of his uh, projections of where we might be. We could be even better than that. If we get the whole country behind, I could imagine maybe we'd even go to every 10 day cycles. Uh, and by that time, we'd have 6 million citizens infected and 60,000 deaths. That's probably the best we could do. And I'm predicting that we'll be somewhere between seven and 10 and we'll be in the 60 to 120,000 deaths. Remember, if you look at all cases that occur, 5% of them are admitted to hospitals and a third of those admissions go to the ICU on, on initially. Next slide. So to go through some COVID updates in the last two weeks, we now have increasing data that 30 to 50% of all infected people have no symptoms. These are the larger studies from Iceland, China, and Japan. Uh, it may not be that high, but even if it's only 20%, that has huge implications for control. So knowing that the viral load in the nose and throat uh, has been studied and the same with symptoms or no symptoms, the asymptomatic infected people have the same viral load in the nose and throat as infected to. There's one study that came out in Lancet Infectious Disease in the last month that showed that it's severe infections, those in the ICU, those on respirators may have 60 times the viral load as people uh, without being uh, called severe. Now, the implication of that is our first responders and the healthcare workers in critical care units are at risk for being exposed to high volume, high loads of virus. We also know dot three, that transmission occurs in patients prior to symptoms. And if you have asymptomatic people who are carrying the virus and transmission prior to symptoms, to me, that's starting to make a case for wearing masks, and I'll come back to that. In some studies, 75% of transmission occur in same families, which suggests very close contact. And we're seeing that certainly in cruise ships and now in our military uh, uh, aircraft carriers and in nursing homes and prisons. Preliminary data from cruise ships said something that is a little optimistic. Roommates with symptoms transmitted more often to their other roommate than those infected people who had no symptoms when they looked at their contacts in the same room. My guess is that the roommates with symptoms were coughing more, exposing higher loads of virus to their uh, roommate. All of this to me uh, argues, and I'll come back to this, maybe there's some value in masks in the general public. Next slide. So, why social distancing matters, I hope to present with a very simplistic slide. If you look at the figure on the left in red, the infected person, and then a susceptible person who is fewer than six feet is in the risk zone for getting infected. And the crude formula at the top says the individual risk is a function of how often the person susceptible has contact with the infected one and how long is the duration of contact. And you could substitute 
viral dose, if you will, for that risk. As the dose goes up, I think infection goes up and also severity probably goes up. Host immune response can actually mitigate the risk with uh, individuals who are closer than six feet. If you have a strong host immune response, imagine a high number there uh, that lowers the risk. If the host immune response in the screwed formula goes down, the risk goes up greatly. And that's what we're seeing with people who are uh, older, who have immune suppression for any reason. Now at the bottom, you see a susceptible person greater than six feet from the infected person. And that's our current goal. And I think the real question is, we could be further than six feet, of course. One of the questions is, why would a susceptible pers a person who's greater than six feet away want to put himself or herself in a zone less than six feet away? And if you look at videos that we're seeing on television of people partying on sandbars in Florida or beaches or playing basketball or sharing wine tasting, um, you know it. And it's even uh, worse for some of the uh, clergy that are telling their constituents to come pray together. And we've seen some of the harm that can come from that. In my own state, where the president of Liberty University invited the students back, and now several of them are infected. And the only thing I can think that would want to bring susceptible people who are away close and deny that they're at risk, three words come to mind, complacency, denial, and hubris. And we have to work on that. It's not just a, a statement to say, how is that possible? We have to try to get those people to pitch in, not do this, stay isolated. Next slide. Well, one of the things epidemiologists uh, have a hard time doing is telling people, how much have we prevented? And on this slide, uh, again, with social distancing, any of the pink dots represents a person that, and a pink line infecting someone else. And you can see over the bottom how the pink lines, every patient who's infected might infect two or three more. But if you look at the gray line and it says here, the person worked from home, that means that they didn't infect two or other people should they have the bad fortune of getting infected. And again, a gray line in the middle, the person who didn't go to the barbecue didn't infect that person who in turn would infect three more, who in turn each one. So it just gives you an image of the gray uh, that you keep in mind the people that we really prevented from this infection. Next slide. One of the, uh, uh, the uh, pictures that is on frequently on uh, social media is this one here. And again, it shows you dynamics of uh, what happens to aerosols when someone sneezes or coughs or just talks in normal voice. And this, this is based on studies that came out of uh, China. First author is, has a last name spelled X-I-E. And so I've told you before that when someone coughs, there's a spectrum in the size of the droplets. And we arbitrarily, uh, for good reason rather, we classify them as aerosols or very small micron, less than 10 micron diameter. And a micron is a millionth of a meter. Those happen, these aerosols happen to stay in the air for two or three uh, hours. So that someone could cough in an enclosed environment. Someone walk in two hours later and these aerosols that are essentially uh, microscopic hot air balloons encasing the virus are still there and could be inhaled and go way down into the lungs because of their small size. We think that's a minor part of uh, the infection pathway today, but most people think it's not zero. What we really need is studies to look at this more carefully. Now, if you look at the larger droplets, just during normal conversation or breathing, most of them tend to fall within one and a half meters or six feet. Uh, so we say that's what dictated or the guideline to stay six feet away or more. What's disturbing are some of the studies that show that with vigorous cough, the large droplets can move in pathways faster than two meters, faster than six feet away. And that means that the six foot guideline is really a guideline 
And maybe this argues also for using masks in a public setting. Next slide. So to get to masks, I want to highlight in the title, there are no data that they don't work, that they don't help. And that's an important starting point because in the past, you've heard the Surgeon General and the CDC suggest that we really shouldn't be using these. Uh, the problem for us though, is the competing problem. There's a national shortage and we really should recognize the high priority first for healthcare workers and I totally agree. And though they are said to have limited efficacy for the general public, if you look at some data from an influenza epidemic or a SARS epidemic that I've referenced, in the influenza studies, the surgical mask did have modest reduction only. Please go back to the slide. However, the surgical mask plus hand washing in concert showed a 67% of reduction of influenza transmission. In the SARS epidemic, hand washing, which is always stressed, 55% reduction. A mass 68% reduction in the combination for healthcare workers, hand washing, gloves, and masks, 91% reduction. It seems to me that we now have, with the cumulative data, enough evidence to suggest that as we face the growing crisis for the next month or two, that for general public, who will be in the general public with some contact to other people, whether six feet or away, no longer, that masks um, could be worn. I still want to say that the high priority is for healthcare workers um, and that we're not talking about N95. We're talking about regular masks that you can make at home, get from a friend, or commercially available. Next slide. Now, some people think that face shields would be even better than masks. And one of them is a good friend, a colleague of mine at the University of Iowa, Mike Edmund, who's been a real advocate for this. Now, these arguments are that whereas the mask covers the nose and the mouth, the face shield covers the eyes. And we know that the conjunctiva are a place where the virus can enter into the body and in, infect the respiratory system. Although you can wear a mask, you still have the ability to touch your face, whereas a face shield really prevents you from touching your face. You would take it off for meals and when leaving the hospital, and when you're about to enter uh, the hospital again, uh, you could either use a new one or uh, if you needed to, uh, wash the outside off, uh, disinfect. And the question is, they could be made for very little uh, amount of money Shouldn't the government ask industry to make these, at least for healthcare workers? And I throw that out for you to con consider. Next slide. So what do we do now? Well, you've heard some of the evidence and some of the people suggesting the same thing. Strict social distancing, widespread testing, and aggressive contact tracing and isolation of exposed. This is a, a role for the public health. Disinfect commonly touched surfaces. Do not touch your face. Hand washing. And today I'm going to suggest wearing a mask in public, recognizing the shortage and also the priority, though, for healthcare workers. It wouldn't surprise me in the next week or so, the Surgeon General and the CDC come out with some statement supporting the use of masks for public. Next slide. Our national priorities, uh, which I touched on, widespread testing with rapid turnaround. We need the 15 minute test everywhere. We need to know who's infected, not only in the community, but in the hospital. And I'm talking not only the patient who may have come in with a gallbladder crisis, who may be actually infected with or without symptoms, but also the healthcare workers who might be there and have symptoms. We need to know what percentage of our citizens are infected uh, to see how close we are getting to the entire population or what we may need for herd immunity. The proportion of the population that's infected that'll protect those currently uninfected. We need to identify the asymptomatic carriers and we need to know through case finding the contacts, whether they have symptoms or not and isolate them. Clearly more 
personal protective equipment is needed for healthcare workers. Um, and you see those stories, particularly from people in New York, other hospitals throughout the country that are seeing this. We need to expand the testing for patients and whoever does the testing has to be wearing the proper equipment. And now you may have seen uh, that we have an expanded workforce being recruited. Plane coming up from Atlanta to New York, full with physician volunteers. Uh, medical students have been asked if they're fourth year students to graduate early and then join in the struggle, uh, which I think is a good idea. But you can't ask volunteers to work if you don't have proper personal protective equipment. We need more data on the impact of COVID-19. I will say, first of all, for the disenfranchised and the resolution of their needs, I'm talking about uh, poor people, homeless people, prisoners, people in nursing homes, uh, the immigrants who are crowded together who are not legal and fearful of reporting to uh, their healthcare workers. I'd like to see more data on the finances of the country. What's the impact on the GDP and other metrics so that we really should consider the financial part uh, put in, and be open to uh, real data, but we just can't have statements uh, that we can't uh, continue with isolation. We need to have real data on finances. Next slide. I want to just say a little about symptoms of coronavirus. And one of the things that I've done is listen to physicians who have been infected, including uh, infectious disease physicians. And they describe, unlike flu, where you feel like out of the blue, with, they remember the hour they knew they had flu. Uh, this is a much more insidious onset with a cough uh, half of the time with fever. And over a couple of days, you may be progressed to uh, really severe fatigue and then uh, shortness of breath after a couple of days of that. So it can linger on. And one of the things that, they, that these physicians have said, they thought they were getting better on day four and five, only to have a week later of uh, marked fatigue, feeling a sickness, afternoon sweats and fever and chills. Some people present with associated GI symptoms. Remember, the uh, virus has uh, a receptors in the GI tract. So it's not surprising that some have loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, loose stool, and vague abdominal discomfort. Cardiac, uh, we now know arrhythmias are either related to the virus or heart decompensation. From a recent study in JAMA Cardiology, 20% of admissions had cardiac injury, uh, and they measure the same markers for a heart attack. And if you do have cardiac injury, it's a marker for higher mortality. Loss of smell and taste is reported in perhaps uh, up to 30% of patients. And the problem with this is that the patients stop drinking because nothing tastes good anymore, and it could make things worse because they get partially dehydrated. And the point I'm making is, there may be a spectrum of symptoms and signs. Next slide. Next slide. There's expansion of drug trials, if you go back. And I just want to measure, make one point, first of all. None have proven efficacy, none. And that's why the trials are going on. The remdesivir study, uh, separate trials of oxygen versus no oxygen. Um, and one team is actually lucky, one company is looking at five days versus 10 days, another company may actually in the long run give more information looking at a control arm uh, as well. It's difficult and you wrestle with the uh, ethics of, of doing that. Hydroxychloroquine is being used with or without erythromycin, azithromycin rather, HIV drugs, and drugs to control the late stage where there's this excessive immune response called cytokine storm. And there are now two or more available monoclonal antibodies targeting receptors, one of them called IL-6 receptor, which is designed to dampen the inflammation and maybe save the life of the patient. Um, there are now people looking at the plasma of patients who have been infected and have high levels of antibody that target the virus, as well as traditional medicines in China. Next slide. Finally, when we eventually look back, 
we'll be evaluated as a society based on our values, how we approach this epidemic. And I'm talking about both leaders and the general public. Truth, empathy, ethics, and justice would be part of my list. Truth is important because it generates trust and it's to be science-based. Empathy uh, generates timely and effective responses by those who have it. Ethics, behavior supporting population health, not personal enjoyment. And justice, was there fairness for all? And I would say as a question, so far, how are we doing? Next slide, final slide. I show you this picture of Albert Camus, the author of the uh, uh, allegorical novel, The Play. And the protagonist in the study is a physician, Dr. Wu, who is asked why against the sea of patients he continues to work tirelessly. And Dr. Wu responds in the book, this whole thing is not about heroism. And it may seem a ridiculous idea, but the only way to fight a plague is with decency. And then he's asked, well, what is decency? And the answer is doing my job. And for all first responders, police, firemen, healthcare workers, support team, uh, you're clearly heroic, but you also show up every day. You're decent, you're doing your job. Let me go to question and answer and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. We have a number of questions. We're going to try to get to as many of these as we can. And of course, Dr. Wenzel was kind enough to share his email address so we can, if we can't get to everybody, we're certainly going to do our darndest. Uh, our friend Katie starts out with a question, Dr. Wenzel. If we know that the peak uh, is still a few weeks or weeks away, and we would need at least 14 days after the peak to come out of the stay-at-home orders, how come the stay-at-home orders aren't going through May? And after that time, how much can we how much time will be required before we can really, you know, go back to normal? Uh, she read a report that there is going to be a recommendation that most of the, those most at risk will be recommended to limit community interactions. Any, any sense of, uh, of, of when normalcy might return? That's a really great question. I think the uh, 14 days is the maximum incubation period. And so you, the questioner put it in perspective. So with the current month, we'll have two maximum, if you will, incubation periods. And I think what will happen is we'll look at the data at three, three and a half weeks. Um, and we'll look not only at cumulative cases, cumulative mortality, but as I'm suggesting, the number of days before there's a doubling. In New York last week, the week before, there's probably two to three days. Uh, Governor Cuomo has picked up on this and he's suggesting it's much longer now, but we'll have to watch that. I've been saying that we could peak before the uh, middle of June. And I think if we do things well, it could be in the latter half of May. Um, how much uh, social distancing we'll need is really unknown, but I think we'll watch the numbers uh, that I've mentioned and probably make a decision whether we need to go into May at all, probably by three and a half weeks. Gotcha. A couple, uh, a little piece of news actually to share with everybody. Uh, one of the folks in the chat just shared with us, going to take you at your word here, that Florida has just announced a stay-at-home order for the whole state. So a little late to the party, but obviously happy to hear that news. Um, in terms of folks thinking about when this might end, one indication, I think the state of California has been particularly strong at letting the data and the science guide their decision making uh, from a policy perspective. And, and y'all may have heard the state of California just close their schools for the, the remainder of the year. I believe that takes them into June. Uh, Dr. Wenzel, your home state of Virginia, Dr. Northam, uh, Governor Northam, just made that call leave within the last two or three days. So if you're looking for a sense of when this might be over, uh, at least from a, uh, that is one indicator. I don't think that's necessarily the day it will end, but that's, that'll start to give you an indication that it's, we are probably gang looking at eight to 10 to 12 weeks, I think is probably a reasonable thing to expect. Is that fair, Dr. Wenzel? Yeah, I think we'll peak probably somewhere around uh, mid-May to mid-June. And what we don't know uh, is the slope of the downside. Uh, it tends to be slower uh, than the rapid exponential rise. And that could seriously uh, go into June. Copy that. Thank you, sir. And that actually gets to our friend Josh's question, which is sort of along those lines, is anyone doing good work on what comes after the peak? Uh, his, his observation, it seems like epidemiologists more or less have a consensus view on the steps that are needed to bend the curve, 
but there's not necessarily good clarity on what comes next. So what's that downslope look like, even if you're well, speculating? Yeah, well, it's a timely question uh, because there have been some reports of a few more cases uh, in China now that they've begun to really relax things. And so very quickly, uh, they've been very aggressive. They've now doubled down on uh, some of their uh, social distancing again and case finding, uh, which actually points to the uh, questioner's um, thinking because we really don't know uh, at what point on the downslope we can really um, uh, be more comfortable that it's really gonna occur by itself because the virus has run out of hits. We've done so well in isolating ourselves uh, from infected people getting in contact with susceptibles. Okay, and Josh had a follow-up for you, sir, which is he says, I am hearing lots of folks concerned about shelter in place lasting until there's a vaccine 12 to 18 months from now. Is that a possible or realistic recommendation that might come from the medical community? Could we hear Dr. I don't, and Dr. Burke? Yeah, I don't think it's possible. It's certainly not realistic. Um, what I worry about is even the month of April, will people just be exhausted by it all, become more complacent? Uh, I think it takes enormous work to do what the citizens of the country are, have done and will do, uh, while the medical team really takes care of the patients. So no, we are not gonna see uh, a year or uh, nine months uh, more of this. Copy that. Uh, our friend Kelly asks a question I'm certainly curious about. She says, uh, Dr. Wenzel, I'm curious about exercising outdoors and running or walking by others uh, who are doing the very same thing. Is six feet enough of a distance? How long do droplets linger in the air? I think her thought is, as I'm running up behind somebody, maybe huffing and puffing, am I necessarily gonna be infected by that you know, minute or two or that moment or two that I'm passing them maybe within a foot or two? Well, first I would applaud anybody who wants to get outside, take a walk in the woods or exercise, uh, particularly away from people. And no one knows how closely uh, you're gonna have contact, but I think the odds are minuscule if you're six feet away from somebody jogging uh, near you. Uh, I think it's uh, good to pay attention to your physical exhaustion, your emotional exhaustion, and you can probably do that well with some kind of, again, walk in the woods uh, uh, or uh, jogging, but I would still try to stay away from people. Gotcha. Our friend Ann Martins from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation up in Seattle, uh, we know they're going through a lot up there, uh, has just put something in the chat for folks if you're interested that has sort of a state by state curve and peak usage uh, projections. Uh, and it's, as she notes, it's optimistic, but if you want to make yourselves, uh, avail yourselves of that, she's been kind enough to put that in the chat. And Ann, maybe you'll toss that on Twitter too, with the hashtag comms for good, and we'll make sure to retweet that. Uh, next question comes from our friend Betsy Marple, and she says, Dr. Wenzel, what about food deliveries? We've all got to eat. Uh, should that be washed? Uh, how should we handle delivery boxes or even uh, the money that's exchanged by so many people? Um, do we have any concern over our mail, which comes from all over the country? There are a couple of comments that I would make. One is, uh, you know, I went to the post office uh, recently and what they've done is, is uh, have a plastic curtain going from the ceiling uh, in front of the people behind the counter, going all the way down to their waist. So there's no way that you can transmit uh, from the postal person to the person picking up the mail or exchanging packages. You, and then you can pass the envelopes or package it back and forth. Obviously, wash your hands. Now, in terms of if you go to the uh, grocery store uh, and you're picking up uh, yourself the uh, items or someone's delivering to them, they bring them in a box or a bag, you bring them out, you have to uh, wipe the outside. The quick answer is we don't know for sure, but a reasonable thing to do if you have the wipes disinfect the uh, uh, outside cardboard. We know that can last for up to a day. Uh, anything, I don't think many foods are in stainless steel, or, but some are plastic, which actually could hold the virus for a couple of days. I would say two things about it. It'd be a reasonable thing to do, and if it makes you more comfortable, then it's okay to disinfect the outside of that. 
Uh, Nancy asked a question, Dr. Wenzel. She says, many of us are trying to support our local restaurants, which we know they're struggling. Our friend Carrie's family uh, owns a restaurant in the New Jersey area. They've had this experience. Uh, but many of us are trying to support our local restaurants by, take, uh, by ordering takeout uh, to help them stay in business and retain their business. Um, in her case, in Nancy's case, she's been doing this with curbside delivery without money exchange. Is there any thoughts on the safety of doing this? Is it okay to go ahead and, and, and patronize some of these small businesses in your local communities? Yeah, I would tell small businesses, first of all, uh, if you can keep everybody outside. Uh, if they have to come somewhere to pay, then they didn't already use their credit card. Do what they did at the post office in my area. Put a piece of plastic uh, down between you and the customer. With the bottom, you're able to exchange money back and forth, hand washing, uh, antiseptic nearby. Uh, for, so for the people who are picking up the food, again, uh, hopefully you're not crowded with other customers uh, any closer than six feet apart. Uh, once you get the food, it's going to be inside a bag. You take the uh, whatever the container is, if it's plastic, styrofoam. And again, we don't know how compulsive you need to be, but it's reasonable to wipe those off. And if it makes you feel better, you wipe them off. Finish with hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Okay, our friend Krista up in Michigan asks, uh, does a handmade mask have any data to support that it will protect the wearer? So I think what Krista's thinking is she has a young family, she's walking out for the, with the family, she's maybe made some masks or tied some bandanas. Is that, is that helpful? Well, uh, the general thinking is probably uh, it does, it might help. Um, there's no study that I can point to to say people with various kinds of homemade masks versus commercial mask versus no mask. Um, but what you're trying to do and what I've tried to do with that one uh, diagram is show you want to prevent the large droplets that uh, might be uh, sp spread by someone more than six feet away. Uh, you don't want to get closer than six feet. Obviously, if you're less, you're going to prevent the large droplets as well. But you try to prevent the large droplets if you're farther than six feet. So. I would, I'm encouraging people, yes, to do that. Okay, next question comes from our friend Doretta, and my mother-in-law desperately wants to know the answer to this one. Is there any truth to the no ibuprofen? If you've been diagnosed with COVID or with a novel coronavirus and you're showing symptoms of COVID-19, is there any truth to the, the thing that's making the rounds on the internet that you should not use Advil or ibuprofen products? Is, is that true? I know there's well, a lot of the, about stacking them with, with Tylenol. With the yeah, there's a the good question because there was one study, a report, not a rigorous study, came out of France suggesting that. Um, but there are no data. I don't think we know. And if you're on those things regularly and you're managing your arthritis, uh, certainly you could talk to your primary care doc, but um, we don't have data to say that you're definitely set up to get worse disease. Okay, so let's just say, uh, I'm just going to play a scenario for you. You're me, you're a 48-year-old man. God forbid I, I fall ill. My sister Becky, the doctor, would say, stack it. It's just like the flu. You, you give a little acetaminophen, you give a little ibuprofen just to try to manage the fever, uh, keep, create some comfort for the patient. Are you saying that's okay to do? I think that's reasonable today because we really are without information. Okay, copy that. So thank you. So right now, just don't have that data. Uh, ibuprofen is probably okay, but no harm if you wanted to avoid it. Is that okay? Oh, I think, again, uh, I would tell people particularly if it makes you comfortable, that helps. Uh, our friend Katha asks, is it possible, please, to compare how Taiwan, for example, has put a controls in place uh, that are having a rapid response, or uh, see if I'm reading this properly, if, is it if possible, please compare how Taiwan, for example, has controlled this early, uh, having a rapid reaction to the pandemic. Well, I think, again, uh, they, uh, somewhat like China, somewhat like Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, really moved in early and aggressively. Um, and the Asian culture was, uh, I think, suited for that kind of aggressive approach, maybe more so than the United States. We have a lot of independent thinking uh, that can get in our way at times. Um, and I, I showed you the, the data early. All those countries that started early and started aggressively uh, really are starting to see the bend. Um, we don't know which components 
um, influence the bend more likely than others. But the combination of social distancing, and particularly in South Carolina, or South Korea rather, their uh, case finding was really instrumental. Um, there are some people who suggested that uh, they are geared more towards the family and therefore were less likely to contact uh, grandparents and elderly during this difficult period uh, compared to Western countries. Don't know if that's true, but it's something to consider and see what the anthropologists uh, think. Uh, our friend Michelle asks, uh, based on the diagram that you shared just a little bit earlier uh, coming out of, uh, of Asia, should social distancing or physical distancing be six feet or six meters? Six meters, obviously, like 19.8 feet, so 20 feet. You had to choose. You were talking to, to your kids or your students or, or friends and family. Are you telling them six feet or are you telling them 20? Well, I would be telling them at least six feet and, if possible, um, farther away, uh, partly because we're in a situation where we have so little information. We're doing the best we can with uh, uh, limited data. There are no studies to show that six feet versus 10 feet versus 25 feet. Um, but it's more likely that the farther you're away, you expect some incremental benefit. Okay, and our friend Betsy asks, someone has suggested uh, that the virus can come in from, uh, from footwear. Uh, we remove our shoes, I guess this is her practice in her home, she removes the shoes at home, uh, but for families with pets, uh, how long does the virus live? Uh, you know, never, she's never washed and sanitized her floor like she does now, says Betsy. Uh, is there anything uh, about people carrying it in on their feet? Yeah, I think it's very unlikely that that's a significant path. Um, you just want to um, not have, uh, I mean, for other reasons, you don't want to have uh, you know, dirty uh, boots or something in your house. But again, uh, no data to talk about uh, what's the risk to uh, having this virus get on an animal um, and then transmitting to people. Theoretically possible, I think it's a minor component. The big ones are that we've talked about our own personal social distancing. So I'm going to take the privilege of a question myself, Dr. Wenzel. We've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks. Can I just ask you a question? I imagine other people are thinking this. How are you so calm about all this, sir? It sure seems like for those of us, particularly working communications work, we're maybe used to being addicted to that phone or to feeds of information coming our way. Most of it's not good. And it seems awfully scary. How are, uh, you know, most, many of us are, are managing anxiety or con deep concern uh, for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our friends, for colleagues. Uh, but you seem pretty relaxed about all of this. Why and how? Well, um, I, I'm certainly recognized that uh, we're in uh, a bad situation. A lot of people are going to get injured, death, die as a result of this. Um, you know, and I think about my children, uh, both of whom work. Uh, uh, and I worry that, you know, they obviously could get infected. Um, but I think one of the things that helps is I'm really comfortable dealing with information, data, and science. And I think if I follow um, the directives from science um, and can convey that, uh, I think we'll all do better that way. I've also been on the part of epidemics uh, previously, I mentioned before, cholera epidemics, totally different, dengue epidemics, H1N1 in Mexico, several countries in South America. And I know that these things eventually get over. Uh, and I think the pathway that it will guide us really, well, if our policy continues to be driven by science and all of that comforts me. Is there, so, so a follow-up, if you would, uh, in your medical training and in the training that you've offered to your students, is there any part of that, uh, of that uh, school experience or training that helps people manage anxiety? Any, any tips that you might have to people, a book to pick up that could perhaps help them think about how frontline workers, healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, and the like, how they've been trained to manage these kinds of situations where you have lots of stress, lots of chaos. My sister has been sharing with me that the hospitals right now are like, there's always a stress level here, but it's, it's here now. And they know that that's, you know, the waves they're seeing now are ankle biters compared to what's coming their way. Yeah, no, there is stress in uh, delivering uh, uh, just medical care for sure. And you do your best. And the comfort can only be that you do your best. And if you're not sure, you ask somebody 
who might have more experience. Um, and that doesn't always happen. But I think if you do your best, uh, you can become more comfortable. Uh, it's no question that the anxiety level, the fear, the desperation, decision-making that clinicians have to make today, and the guidance, uh, just the scary notes coming out from administrators in uh, some hospitals, we will back you up if you decide not to intubate somebody whose life may be saved, but is unlikely compared to somebody else in your emergency room who's younger, has fewer comorbidities, and also needs that one available uh, respirator, uh, the ventilator. These are tough times. These are scary times. And I think the best thing you can do is um, go somehow pay attention to your physical needs and emotional needs. People need to sleep. It's not as easy these days. Uh, people should get out and exercise. People should get some hobby, perhaps, that keeps them busy. Um, and you can't ask people to become exhausted physically and emotionally. There's something called uh, Lombardi scheduling, and it may be named for Northern Italy, but where they take healthcare workers and have them work for a week, and then stay off for two weeks. And that's the outside incubation period. And if they're still healthy, we know that they can go back to work, even without testing them for the most, most likely, if we don't have tests available. I would advocate actually the ability to test them and know in 15 minutes before they came back. But during the two weeks off, um, they can maybe normalize their life a little bit, cut down on the stress. And I've been thinking about the Lombardi method and it may have more benefits uh, than uh, just uh, the scheduling and trying to keep healthy people at work. Uh, guys, our friend Nancy now has a question and she says, how does one stay more than six feet away from others in a crowded grocery store? As much as we try, it's next to impossible. And yeah, well, there. I, I would, I, I agree. I, I think uh, there's some that you can't. And uh, if you know the hours of the store, there are people that tell me if they get there in the first hour, they do better. Other people say it's already loaded for a half an hour sometimes. And you can't always uh, do that. One of the reasons that I'm also suggesting if you're in a uh, in public these days, including the crowded grocery store, do your best to avoid those aisles that are crowded, but have a mask, a plain mask. I really think uh, that's part of the answer. Now remember, we're going into it's particularly severe, so we're gonna see more patients, therefore more asymptomatic patients. And I think, again, the rationale for a mask is beginning to grow stronger for me. Our friend Jennifer Oldham out in Nashville sending good thoughts her way. She says, if you recover from the virus, can you get it again? Or do you have you built up immunity? Yeah, you probably built up immunity. Almost every virus that uh, we have experienced with, those of us who ever had measles or mumps or chicken pox, for the most part, uh, you have lifelong immunity. Sometimes that immunity fades, uh, and it fades after varying periods of time, 10, 20 years or so. Uh, and other times it lasts forever. The yellow fever vaccine we're finding lasts forever. Uh, and that's a change in the last couple of years. So with a new virus that we really don't know anything about, um, I, my thinking would be you're probably safe for at least one, two, three, four years. What happens after three years or so, um, we ought to check. But right now I think uh, you're gonna be immune for a while. Copy that. Uh, we're going to take some more questions. Are you okay? So we're getting up to the top of the hour. Could you stick around for just a couple more minutes, sir? Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you. So we'll, we'll, we're going to go about five or six more minutes, folks. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of asking another question, which I think is probably on the minds of almost everybody. So most folks, I suspect, dialing into this uh, work in, in communications for goods. They serve at foundations and nonprofits or social sector focused consultancies. Imagine many of us are trying to think we're working from home. Our lives have been a little bit disrupted, but it's nothing compared to the, the docs and the nurses and the EMTs and all the frontline workers out there, including folks working in grocery stores and elsewhere. Uh, what could we do to be helpful? Uh, if, you, if you had a magic wand and could say, if everybody in America could just do these couple of things to help out the frontline workers, so beyond the social distancing, is it sending a warm meal over to the hospital? Is it making a donation to a particular organization? What, if you could wave a magic wand and do two or three things, recommend things that we might be able to do from the safety of our own home, what would those things be? 
Well, I think there are a number of people who are actually manufacturing, making at home a mask for healthcare workers. That's an enormous benefit. That's a great thing to do. And it turns out, uh, I have a daughter who's uh, a nurse practitioner with a specialty in cardiology and a focus on uh, electrophysiology, all the people with abnormal rhythms. Um, and one of her neighbor's high school sons actually used a 3D printer to help her put together a face shield. So the printer helped make the band around the forehead uh, going into the back of the head and actually could put the piece of plastic on the front end. I, I thought, wow, that person did a lot to make me, you're talking about what made me uh, comfortable, and I give her more protection because I think the more healthcare workers that use face shields today, uh, the better. So make masks, make face shields, uh, and you might even talk to your uh, close friends or neighbors, uh, what do you need? Um, can I, you know, pick up uh, dinner? I'm going to pick up mine. What's ordering one more? And uh, I'll leave it available. We'll still keep our social distance. Uh, that's a wonderful thing, too. Yet usually in times of stress, we think we'll get together, we'll hold hands, we'll pray together, or sing together, uh, have a glass of wine together, or hug each other. We can't do that with this disease. It's different. So some of the things that I mentioned be enormously helpful. Thank you, sir. Uh, our friend Jamila asks, uh, why are places like Sweden claiming herd mentality? Might that work in some places or is that just irresponsible in your view? Um, I'm not sure what the term herd mentality means. I think Maybe. they're saying they're just not taking, sort of like Mexico, they're not taking any extraordinary yeah. actions. Yeah, I think they're uh, testing their luck. Uh, and I would come back to some of the statements. Uh, are they just in denial? Are they over complacent? Are they just hubris? Uh, this is an equal opportunity virus. It's not going to affect uh, anybody uh, north or south of the equator uh, or in between. Um, unfortunately, um, that will hurt them eventually. And Rebecca asks, how important is it not to touch your own face, which I just did, and wash your hands thoroughly and often when you're in your own home and remain isolated? So how often should be, if you're, if you're staying in house all day, you're not me going out to walk the dog in a few minutes, how important is it to keep washing your hands and, and, and try to avoid touching your face if you've been isolated for, say, 10 days, two weeks, whatever it might be? I think if you're home and uh, you really washed your hands carefully, uh, when you came home, after you've managed whatever groceries or mail or anything else that you've done, um, and you haven't touched anything else, I'm, uh, you know, I think you're probably okay. It doesn't hurt to just get up if you want when you're stretched, go wash your hands. Um, and the only reason to do that is if you, are, for some reason, don't think you've disinfected them as well or earlier. But I think you're probably, probably safe at home, once you're at home for the most part, and you've already done everything you can to disinfect the commonly touched surfaces that you may have contaminated with something you brought in and washed your hands carefully beforehand, you're in good shape. Our friend Robin asks a question, uh, and that is, what is the status of testing in our country, uh, in your opinion? Can you just give an estimate of where you think we're at? Is this really being done state by state? And she, uh, Robin's down in our, our friend Robin's down in Austin. She says, in Texas, it's clear the reported numbers are inaccurate due to the lack of testing. Well, unfortunately, uh, because of the lack of testing, uh, all our numbers are inaccurate. Um, you know, I mentioned before that uh, you need a good numerator and denominator. Um, and uh, we really, don't have a good denominator. We don't know who's infected out there. Um, and we need them uh, badly. Uh, they're rolling out tests. I mean, we had a lot of problems initially with an ineffective test that was inaccurate. Um, and, um, and then we ignored the, the overtures from Europe to be able to employ a test that the World Health is using. And so for a while, only state labs were doing this. Now, entrepreneurial labs all over the country are setting up their own testing uh, techniques. And that's been a boon, that's really helpful. But we still need much more and we need the rapid tests uh, because the turnaround is critical to how you manage uh, people, patients, healthcare workers, 
uh, workers uh, anywhere else that might come in contact with uh, people. Um, we're way behind. Um, I would hope that uh, in two weeks we'll have significant changes. Okay, next question comes from our friend uh, Phoebe who asks, Dr. Wenzel, what is it about diabetes that puts individuals at higher risk? Why is it if you, if you are diabetic that you are at a higher risk for this disease? Well, the quick answer is nobody knows. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, diabetes uh, does uh, cause people to have some increased risk of infections, you know, particularly things like skin infections um, that we're aware of. Uh, why this would, uh, you know, influence things, uh, we're not sure. And uh, that's the answer. Nobody knows. Okay. And our friend Andrew just did a very kind thing. She just, if you look in the chat, gang, uh, you will see that she put a, uh, I believe it's a she, uh, put a link in for a maker mask, 3D printer for respirator quality masks. Uh, so thank you for that. And chances are there may be one for a face shield as well. If you can look around in there, if you have the ability to do 3D printing, that might be a really wonderful, good thing to do for folks in your local community, particularly first responders and folks working out there in the hospitals on the front lines. Um, some just uh, questions for folks that seem to be focused on kind of, is this going to be available? Yes, we're making a recording. We always do. This will be posted on the network's YouTube page. Dr. Wenzel's last session uh, had over almost 4,000 views, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we will post this up online just as soon as we can. We'll also try to get the live notes out that we've been creating uh, to you as quickly as we possibly can. And Dr. Wenzel will be back in a couple of weeks. I think, sir, just mindful of your time and, and out of respect, uh, we will leave it there. Uh, gang, a couple quick pieces of housekeeping before everybody runs off. If someone's looking for something to read who is not an MD, this is what's been keeping me uh, uh, going the last couple of days. Bill Bryson wrote a wonderful book called The Body. It's a little bit thick, so it's going to take me some time to get into it, but it is a wonderful sort of uh, layman's, in fact, the subtitle is kind of fun, A Guide for Occupants. I am one. I have a body and I am occupying it. I hope to do so for quite some time. But this is a wonderful book for those of you who are sort of trying to understand, maybe you don't remember bio from high school or, or didn't uh, take any, any bio classes in, uh, in, in college. So suffice to say, highly recommend that. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, coming up, uh, so Dr. Wenzel, I guess the first thing I should say before I let you go, sir, is thank you again for coming back. And pleasure. Joining us. I think you've done a tremendous amount of good for a lot of good folks who are rightly concerned and trying to understand this, this uh, crisis as it's unfolding at a different pace in different places. Uh, and grateful that you'll be coming back to join us again in a couple of weeks where I'm sure we'll all have a lot more questions and unfortunately probably some rougher seas in front of us. Uh, for those folks who are interested, we will be back on Friday. Tristan, if you jump to the next slide. Uh, Professor Peter Loge from George Washington University wrote a wonderful book called Soccer Thinking for Management Success, is going to talk to us about some of what he learned from studying the beautiful game. Uh, soccer is a sport that does not call plays. Uh, it is run on a system, and it's a wonderful sort of lesson for all of us who are doing remote work, who maybe just two weeks ago we were in the office, now we're working remotely. Maybe you're managing a team or managing an organization. Uh, what does it look like to help people understand when they have autonomy and when they should be working and how to do that most effectively? So Peter's been kind enough. He'll make a little time for us on Friday. And then Tristan, if you'll advance, we'll have the invitation out to you for that. Uh, just in a little while. Next week, our good friend Doug Hathaway read the entire 450-page CDC Crisis Communications Handbook. One of the big tells he has coming out of it is most of these uh, crisis comms lessons from the CDC are based around an event that is uh, banded by time like a hurricane, not something like this, a pandemic, interestingly. So he has taken some good notes. He's made a few adjustments. He's going to talk to us about what we can learn about the different phases of communication during an unfolding crisis, particularly one like this where the, frankly, the, the end date is just not quite known to us yet. And then on April 10th, so that's, I believe, next Friday, if I've got this right, uh, our good friend, Nat Kendall Taylor, uh, doctor, Nat Kendall Taylor, uh, PhD, not MD, uh, from the Frameworks Institute will join us to talk about framing for change during COVID-19. Of course, we know one of the things that's coming out of this. And Dr. Wenzel, do you feel like this is an inflection point for, for the world or for our society right now? It's hard to know because we're in it. But, but do you have a sense things are going to be different maybe a year or two from now, sir? Uh, I think there'll be a lot of changes after this. Uh, we'll be thinking about this for more than a year or two. This is a 9-11 uh, virus uh, type thing. Um, this, we'll remember what we did, where we were, how we reacted. 
Yeah, I fully subscribe to that. I think one of the things we all need to be mindful of as communicators is that narratives really shape the way that we all make decisions uh, from a policy basis and even on a personal level. Uh, out of 9-11, some of the narratives that emerged were around safety and security and some of the policy actions were things like the Patriot Act or the militarization of the police. Why does the police department in Topeka have a tank now? Uh, there are some, some big narratives that will emerge out of all of this, uh, potentially very positive, perhaps some that are less positive. I would argue that a lot of xenophobia and racism that has emerged over the last 20 years found its home beginning in 9-11 uh, and in the early days after that. So uh, Nat's going to talk to us a little bit about how to frame some of the issues we're all working on and to start thinking about some of the narratives that may emerge from this on the other side, whenever that may be. Uh, so we're going to continue to gather everybody because we think it's important to get together. I'm grateful to all of you. Glad that everyone is, uh, we hope, safe and well and remains that way. Uh, we will be back with Dr. Wenzel in about two weeks. And for now, uh, just again, on behalf of everybody, I had about 300 folks with us today. Thank you so much, sir, for the kindness and generosity of making the time for us. Uh, to everybody else, please do be well, and we will be back with you again next week and over the next couple of weeks, just continuing to try to provide you good information to help you do the good work. Uh, be safe. Be well. We'll talk to you all soon. Cheers. Thank you, sir. Right. You bet. Take care.